This episode of the Crack House Chronicles is brought to you by Better Help. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? Better Help will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. This is not a crisis line or a self-help line. It's professional counseling done securely online. Now, Dale, this is a broad range of expertise that is available, which may not be locally available in many areas. Yeah, this service is available for clients worldwide. Worldwide? Worldwide. Worldwide. And you can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get a timely and thoughtful response, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. So you don't have to worry about sitting in an uncomfortable waiting room and waiting on a traditional therapist. Yeah, which is really good in this time. You don't really want to go and sit in the waiting room with a bunch of people with stuff going on that's going on today. Sit there with a mask on and, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's no good. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches. And if you don't like your counselor, it's pretty easy to change. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. It's more affordable than traditional online counseling and financial aid is available. That's always good. Right that's, a, that's awesome. Yeah. And BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. That's right. So visit their website and read the testimonials. They're posted there daily. All right, Dale. Visit BetterHelp.com slash CHC. That's Better H-E-L-P. And you can join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. That's right. In fact, so many people are using it now. They're actually recruiting counselors in all 50 states. So a special offer for our listeners, you can get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash C-H-C. you got to use the code word BetterHelp.com slash C-H-C. Hey, what is up, everyone? Welcome to the Crack House Chronicles. I am Donnie, your host, and with me is a man that is asking everyone that if he ever ODs on Viagra, you guys better take it pretty hard. It's Dale. <laughs> oh, yeah. What's yeah. up, man? That's <laughs> it. Yeah, you, bud? <laughs> oh, doing well. How about yourself? No comment on that one? <laughs> oh, no. It's kind of... No, I'm good enough. <laughs> you see, sometimes Dale knows about these and sometimes he don't. <laughs> and today, he didn't know. He didn't know nothing. <laughs> Woo. Yeah, that's it. I'll come hard up for an answer on that. Yeah, that's it. What we got going on today, Dale? I don't know. What do you got going on? Well, we want to remind everybody to check out our social media pages, man. <sighs> like us on Instagram. Follow us on Facebook. Check out our YouTube channel. Very good. Yep. And click that notification bell. Subscribe. Uh, check out our website. Click our, our bells and whistles. Check out the website list and our merch page. Get you a t-shirt, guys. Yeah. Show some support. Show some love <laughs> to the crack house. Yeah. So well, let's go ahead and make a comment or something. That's it. Let us know you're out there. Do we have any shout-outs or anything anybody want to recognize? Uh, yeah. How about we just shout-out to old Stick Elliott. He gave me an idea of this to do this story uh, the other week when we were having lunch up here at the road up the... Hit the honey hog, and uh, I figured it'd be a good one to do, and we got into it, and man, it's going to be a good one. Yep. It, I'm, I've been excited about this ever since we brought it up, and it was suggested to us, and, and Dale, this is a very local case for us here. And I had no clue. I had no clue either until we got to researching this, and I was I was blown away, man. Yeah. Blown away. Did you get back? Oh, yeah, I'm back here. You see me, don't you? <laughs> yep. All right. Yep. The... Wind blew me in. All right. Dale, this story begins on... It's actually we've got a story before the story, don't we? It's, it's, it's two stories within one. Yes. And But we're going to give the back story first. Back story of the front story. Yeah. Or the back. It's the... It's, man, this is crazy. This is a crazy story. And I can't tell... I mean, it's, it's so close to us. It's, it is one county over across the state line. Yep. And it's in Gaffney, South Carolina. Yep. But it don't start there. No, it don't start there. <laughs> but this is pretty... It actually starts right up the road here. <laughs> yeah, but it's pretty pretty much based out of that area. But, yes, very much so. But we're going to give... This starts on May the 19th of 1967. Shout out, 1967. Yeah. And it's got Roger 
Zane Deadman, and his wife, Annie Lucille Deadman. Now, Dale, they were, this was on a Friday evening on May the 19th, 1967. Right. And they were going out. Yes. They were going out uh, bar hopping, drinking, and just having a good old time. Right. Now, we'll get a little backstory of the news, folks. They got married in 63. Okay. And uh, Roger was 23 and Annie was 30. So she, she was had, seven years older than him, a little bit older. Right. And uh, she had three kids previous. Yeah. So it was someone they met. But he was getting ready to go off to Vietnam. So uh-huh. He uh, went ahead and popped that on the parents and stuff that they was going to get married. So they got married before he left to take off to, to Vietnam. Mm-hmm. And then when he got back, he got back, and then that's when they started going out and stuff. But uh, it wasn't really uh, the glamorous marriage he'd been waiting to get home to. Yeah. It was a little more a little more tension when he was there at the house instead of just sending home paychecks. Yeah. So he liked to go down to uh, the Highway 18 truck stop down there in Gaffney and hang out on the weekends. With the, tru- with the truck drivers? Yeah, <laughs> with the truck drivers. And even when he got home and got him a good job at Fiber up there in Spindale, you know, and he thought, well, I'll get home and get me a good job, start making some money, and everything will be a little bit better. But mm-hmm. she still liked to go hang out at the truck stop. So. With the truck drivers? Yeah, apparently. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what I heard. Yeah, and in uh, 1966, little Roger Jr. was born, you know. Yeah. So they had a kid together, so now they have four kids. And they range anywhere from one to 13. Here, yeah, that's a big span of getting ready to go into. So now we're getting ready to go out on that, that Friday night. Yeah, morning. that's a good backstory on Roger and... That was the the, Luce, quick, the quick and narrow. Yeah, Roger and Lucille Deadman. Yeah. Like we said before, they were they were going out on this Friday night on May the nineteenth, nineteen sixty seven, to have a good old time drink and have a good time. But they had been fussing. They'd yeah. been arguing. Yeah, she wanted to go to the highway <laughs> truck stop with the truck, with the truck drivers. <laughs> truck drivers, and he didn't really want to go. But you know, he bowed down and said, "Well, let's go ahead and go because yeah. I know to make you happy." Yeah, and they had gotten in an argument about. I, I think it was some guy. I think so. Did. She had, I, I don't know if she'd been talking to him or flirting with him or something. Well, probably they got there, probably got to drinking and stuff, and then the more he thought about it, whether she was or not, she probably thought she was. Yeah. But she may have been. Well, a man gets to drinking, the truth's going to come in his head. He's going, yeah. Yeah. The truth's going to come out somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Especially uh, when she had to go to the Highway 18 truck stop. <laughs> with the truck drivers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But yeah, they got to fussing, and they left there, and they were going – to another bar. Yeah. Do some drinking. There must have been lots of bars there now, because they're not now, is it? I don't know. I don't, I don't really go up to him, Gaffney. We go no. down to the, the Yellow Mall. What do you call that thing? The oh, Prime Outlet. Prime Outlet Mall. R- around here is the Yellow Mall. Yeah. That's a bunch of rednecks. Yeah, it's right there on the 85. <laughs> it's, a, it's right there at the peak. And it's yellow. Yeah, and it's very yellow. Yeah, you can see it from the highway. You can. That's it. Anyway, as far as downtown Gaffney, yeah. I have no idea. But anyway, apparently back then there were plenty of bars and stuff where all the people would go hang out and go bar hopping. Mm-hmm. A few drinks here, a few drinks there. Yep. Cuss and cuss and go to another one. Yep. Especially for these two. Mm-hmm. Seem to be the the events of the evening. So, Dale, they end up at a donut shop in Gaffney. Donut shop. Yep. And they were still fussing. Of course. Yep. And... Yeah, said so they even got into it a couple places. Like, we even one time she tried to leave him, and he kind of went and grabbed her and got be back control of the car. And then she got out, and then she tried to jump out the door, and he would pull her back. Just kind of, you know, mm. and intoxicating been, fussing, I guess. And several people had even seen this, and right. I witnessed the stuff so going they, on with them. So I figured they probably left to maybe go get something to eat, see if they couldn't calm down a little bit or something. Yeah, sober up a little bit. Yeah. But, yeah, they ended up at this donut shop, and Roger went in – I guess to get something or do something in the store. Right. And when he came back out, Lucille was gone. Gone. She had, she had checked out. Yeah. And he didn't think a lot of it because she had done this before. She gets a drink and she'd just leave. Right. She just, now, the car was still there. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Keys in it. But she was just gone. She like, was gone. Like she's seen because I'm assuming, I mean, we weren't there, but, you know, I'm assuming they were all out drinking and stuff together. They probably... The whole crowd probably leaves the bars and goes to get something to eat or whatever, kind of like the the Waffle House crowd or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then she probably thought maybe she'd catch a ride home with somebody else or went home with somebody else. And that's what he thought. Right. Because, you know, 67, ain't nobody calling anybody. No. They don't, no cell phones. No. Mm-mm. Even if you have a pay phone, you couldn't call her because you don't know where she's at. So. That's it. Yeah. So he decides that he's just going to go home. Yeah. Yeah, he waited a while, looked around, couldn't find her anywhere. And decided the best thing he can do, he was just going to go home, which was probably about a 45-minute ride. Yeah, they were going back to, back to Spindale. Spindale. Yeah. And uh, 
I guess back in there's a lot more drunk driving going on. <laughs> Forty five minute drunk ride down the road eating donuts. But just a note, uh, <clears throat> Roger Deadman's originally from Cliffside. Cliffside, Cliffside. But they, they, him and Lucille lived in Spindale. Right. But yeah, he went on back home to Spindale. Right. And the next morning, Dale, Lucille's body was found. Right. Yeah, it said that uh, he went home, passed out because you know the the oldest kid was thirteen. She had been watching the baby. Mm-hmm. He woke to a somebody beating on the door yeah it was the police so he said he got up and asked the the 13 year old to take care of the baby while he went and see what was going on yeah. and that's when they informed him that her body was found and it was lying on jerusalem road and yep. this is in union county south carolina dale Demon was informed of his wife's death after identifying her and dale he was arrested yes he was mm-hmm. and he was interrogated quite extensively on her Murder. Well, well, the problem is when you get they're so drunk they don't remember what happened. He, yeah, he knew they had gotten into it, and somebody had seen him driving home that night and called the police and gave uh, gave them his tag number. So they knew about what time he was coming home, which did not match up to the story that he told mm-hmm. about what time they were at the restaurant. But if he was really drunk, I'm sure time is the last thing was on his mind. So he probably didn't really know exactly what happened or when. But the police had pretty much decided that Roger was the killer. Oh, yeah. And, you know, that's the way it works. Yeah. And she was found nude in the middle of the road, sprawled out, just laying there. Butt naked, yeah. Yeah. But Roger clung to his innocence the whole time. Right. But, yeah, he was interrogated and even gave, like, I don't know, like kind of like false... Well, they picked him up and took him back to the, to the scene of where they had found him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they said that uh, he had made a confession. But I think it was all made up. Yeah. Because uh, he knew they had been in a fight. That's about all he could remember. Mm-hmm. So and they said, you know, even he said, well, he didn't know if they had been in a fight. And if he, if he had taken her clothes, he didn't know what he'd done with them. And I think they kept on and on and on until they made up his story for him. This is what really what happened here. And Roger claimed that he'd been questioned for more than two continuous days, even after his arrest. Oh, I'm sure. But they never admitted, you know, knowledge of the crime. He never admitted knowledge of the crime. And like we said, witnesses testified that Roger was in a cafe in Spindale, North Carolina, at the time of her death. But yeah, I did hear that uh, there were some witnesses that said that they had saw him there, but I don't think the police ever went to look him up. But nonetheless, Dale, <clears throat> um, Roger went to prison. Yes. They went in and told him that he had a uh, confession. They did not have a written confession. They did not have a tape-recorded confession. Uh-uh. All they had was three police officers said he confessed to him saying, no, I didn't. But the jury, it took, what, four hours to convict him? Yep. And they gave him 18 years or 18 years. On the chain gang. Hard labor. Yeah. Dale, on December 12th, 1967, he was c- convicted of manslaughter based largely on police testimony that he confessed while in police custody. Okay. We're going to move just a little bit forward to February the 8th, 1968. And this is when a guy named Bill Gibbons, he is the managing editor or the managing director of the Gaffney Ledger as a newspaper. Right. And he received a phone call by yep. a stranger. About lunchtime, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Who told him to take out three pieces of paper. Yeah, pretty weird. Yeah. And write some notes on these three pieces of paper. Right. Told the guy, I said, uh, take out three pieces of paper. And the guy's like, what the hell? You know? Yeah. And he goes, on the first paper, I'm going to go write this. He's like, go by the junior high school up toward the chain gang road. Follow the road up to the second bridge, and you'll see a dirt road. Turn on that road and go to the top of the hill to the edge of the woods. Shut off your car. Get out and face I-85. Walk about a quarter mile down the down the hill and up to the top of the next one and look for a pile of brush. And then he said, okay. Mm-hmm. Now get out the second one. Yep. The second one says, go to the bridge on the Old Fork Road. Look in the water on the downhill side. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. And then on the third one, it just says, March 20th, 1967, Jerusalem Road, Union County, Annie Lucille Deadman, Spindale, North Carolina. Yep. 
So he's like, well, why do you want me to write all this stuff down? It don't, it don't make no sense, you know, and the stuff. And he's thinking it's a prank call or something, right? Mm-hmm. And then he goes, well, wait a minute. Go back to number one. Now write Nancy Christine E. Smith Street on that paper. And he goes, well, what's, a, what's this got to do with anything? And he said, is this her name or last name? He says, it's not her last name, but that'll, that's all I'm going to give you. That's mm-hmm. the name I'll do. And he said, on the second one, write Nancy Carol Paris Chatham, Chatham Avenue on the next one. So he does. And then he says, now, go and get the sheriff and go follow the directions I've given you. And see Don't go doing. alone. Right. Make sure you take the sheriff with you. Make sure you take the sheriff. Right. All right. Now, they go out and they get to the bridge first. Right. I figured because that's the easy one. Yep. And they're looking around the bridge, looking down, and down in the water. Sure enough. There's a female form, a female body, nude, face down in the water. Right. Some of her was on the bank, but most of her, her face was her down. Face, in, yeah, head, face down yeah, into face the water. Face down in the water. Yeah, facing down right. in the water, like. So it's like, holy shit! <laughs> it yeah, was not a prank call. No. So they they get down to the body and find some bruises on her and cigarette burns in her back. Yep, she's been raped, and killed, strangled. Yep. She had a severe bruise around her neck where she'd been. Yeah, red marks and right. bruising around her neck. Yep. So it looked like she'd been strangled. So now they reset and go get a few more people and go check the second site. Yep, they're going out there to the brush pile they were talked about. Right. They were told about, and so, they're looking around and they see a foot, a naked foot sticking out right. under the brush. Yeah, so it was actually about three quarter mile. They had to walk a little farther than you thought. Mm-hmm. But yeah, then that's where they found the second body. Yep, basically the same condition. Mm-hmm. Nude and had been. Beaten, scratched up, cigarette, raped. cigarette burns, raped, and strangled. Yeah, the same stuff going on. Yeah. Yeah, Dale, the first body they found in the, under the bridge, her name was Nancy Carol Paris. Right. And she was 20 years old. Yep. And her husband had reported her missing after she had taken her dog for a walk. I think it had a poodle. Yeah, he'd give it to her for Christmas. Mm-hmm. And she took the dog for a walk at night and never returned. Right. Yeah, he would said that he had went to uh, shoot pool or something, and uh, mm-hmm. he had uh, stepped out next door to grab some bite to eat, and had missed a phone call. And then uh, witnesses had said that they had actually seen her um, go into a cafe or somewhere and uh, change a ten dollar bill to get changed to, mm-hmm. to make a phone call. So right. I was assuming that she tried to call him, but that was the last time she was seen. Yep. And Dale, the second woman they found, she was actually a fourteen year old girl. Right. And her name was Nancy Christine Reinhardt. Yeah, she went by Tina. Yeah. 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 Sorry about that. Christine, Tina. Yeah. That makes that makes sense. Yeah. And she was fourteen years old and she was killed on February the eighth. Yeah, she'd been missing since uh January twenty ninth. Yeah. And uh said she had she had went to uh went by her grandmother's house, talked to her, showing her this new outfit she had and was gonna go up to the top dollar store where her mother worked to show her the outfit, but this was about 2.30 in the afternoon on the 29th, and she was never seen again. Pretty big span of time there, time she went missing and time she was found. So it was wintertime, so there probably wasn't a lot of decomposition. No, it was eight or ten days maybe, you know, yeah. some, somewhere in there. Yeah. Anyway, so after uh, they find the two bodies, and the only person who's getting phone calls is this Gibbons guy from the newspaper, right? Yeah, so Bill every, Gibbons. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, what did I say? Gibbons guy. Gibbons guy. But his name's Bill Gibbons. Yeah, he's, anyway. Yeah, he's, he's, the local, he's the newspaper guy. Okay, so it's, um, the only ones getting these calls is, uh, now, it did say that when he called um, Gibbons the first time to give him the information about the three pieces of paper, he did tell him to call the police and tell him that this guy had called him. And about an hour or two later after that, that guy called the police station to make sure the phone call had been made. Yeah. So the law enforcement did know, technically, that, he wasn't the only one who knew about it, but they didn't give out that information. Yeah. So people in the, in the neighborhoods are starting to wonder how this guy knew this stuff. And yeah, so, they were actually the the community and townspeople were suspecting Bill Gibbons of being the killer. Right, because he's the only one who knew anything. Which yeah, it's kind of weird. Why is he getting calls? Why Small is he, town spreads fast. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Why is he the only one getting calls? Why are they telling him? Right. So and they didn't want to let all the details out, so they wanted to keep some stuff to themselves that only the killer knew. Right. Yep. Exactly. So then on February twelfth. Yeah. He gets another call. Yeah. Bill Gibbons received a second call from the same anonymous man. Right. And he stated there would be more deaths and also said that he was the killer of Mrs. Deadman. This Lucille Deadman, 
that was killed the previous year. Yep. And he provided a lot of unreported details of Mrs. Debman's killing and stated that Miss Debman, that Roger Debman should be released from prison because yep. he was, he was serving time for something he didn't do. Right. So why, why was this anonymous caller feeling sorry for this Roger Debman in prison? You think why? Yeah. I think he's wanting credit for his kill. I think he is too. I don't think he's. I mean, maybe it might have been a, a little bit of that or something, you know, because he's like the damn chain gang and he ain't done nothing. But I think the biggest reason is he wanted credit for the kill. I don't think, mm-hmm. you know, because that's a lot of serial killers. That's the they want that the fame and or the attention. I guess. More, I guess so. More so than yep. that. that's what I thought when you know a lot of people were saying that he. He must, you know, have some compassion. He was worried about this guy in jail. And no, he was worried about his kill number. That's what I think. Yeah. You know, because, you know, he didn't really have to say that. You know, he didn't say nothing about it. He could just not even mention her at all, and this guy would still be in there. Oh, or, yeah. Or well, however long it's been. Yeah, well, he had an 18-year sentence. He'd have been out, but still whew, working hard on the chain gang. Gaffney in, in the summertime. Yeah. Yeah. It's rough, it's man. Rough. Yeah, when, so when he called in, he had a lot of details about the events, even – talking about how uh, she had passed him on the road in a high rate of speed. So he had followed them back mm-hmm. to the donut shop. Yeah. And he had seen them fussing and fighting in the car and in the parking lot and stuff and said, as soon as uh, Roger, I want to keep calling him Bill. So as soon as Roger went into the to the shop to get some food, he went up and asked her if she needed a ride. Mm-hmm. And she said, heck yeah, and jumped in the car with him. And so she didn't even question it. So then – uh, he was telling what she had on her shoe size. The stuff was in her purse. A lot of specific details yeah, about lots her. Lots of stuff. I mean, it was, just, it was crazy how detailed stuff that he had. So they knew that he had to be involved in this. Yeah. So it was definitely not made up just to get the guy out of jail. Yep. Yeah, this uh, anonymous caller, he was reporting and telling the police and, you know, the, the editor of the paper saying – He's serving my time. Right. Yeah, and actually that's the the time when he called and given all these details and information, he called the guy home. He called him at home. Yeah, he the, called him twice in the office, but then at about 930 he called him at his house. With the sheriff sitting there in his home. Oh, my God. Yeah. And <laughs> and he even told him, saying that, that he was a psycho. Yeah. And that if they don't catch me, there will be more deaths. Yeah, so why don't you turn yourself in? Yes, well, no, I'll get the chair. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Man. He's going to have to shoot me like the dog that I am. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then he hung up, and then he called back, what, 10 minutes later and goes, oh, yeah. She also had some Harris Teeter stamps in her pocketbook. I meant to tell you that. Yep. <laughs> so it was, he was really detail-oriented. He knew a lot really, about these his victims. It was really weird. Mm-hmm. All right, Dale. The next day on February the 13th, 1968, a female 15-year-old named Opal Diane Buxon was abducted and thrown in the trunk of a car. Yeah, that's sad right here. Yeah, man. while walking to a school bus stop with her sister. Yeah, and it was on a long, like a long dirt road, I guess. Like right? a half a mile dirt road. Yeah. And uh, there was three of them, right? It was her, I think her brother, her younger brother, and the sister. And she, Opal had got way out in front of the rest of them. You know, yeah, she was walking ahead of them. Right. And the younger sister observed opal being thrown in the trunk of this car yeah, his car pulled up the guy jumps out and grabs her slings her in the trunk yep and she described it the car as either dark blue or black right yeah it actually said did you know she seemed as like a 30 year old maybe white guy 25 well, to 30 year old yeah, somewhere along there and when she screamed he looked up and saw her and then scared her so she ran to go back home yeah to go get her dad yep and when he went she went to get her dad, and they got back up there. All they saw was some of Opal, Opal stuff with her school books laying on the ground. Yeah, like it was a big struggle. Struggle, yeah. Yeah, and some tire marks, and that was it. Yep. And so they didn't they, have a phone, so he had to. that guy had to go to his mom's, use the phone to call the police. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. God, that'd be awful. All right, Dale. After learning of uh, Opal Buxton's abduction on the morning of February the 13th, uh, a lot of local residents began patrolling the area. Yeah, they was out looking for them because now they had a description in a car. Yep. And there was two guys that, in particular that helped a lot in this 
search. And one of them, his name was Henry Transu. He was a local golf pro hmm. down at the Cherokee National Golf Course okay. down there in Gaffney, South Carolina. And the other one was a game warden by the name of Lester Skinner. Now, Dale, while they were out patrolling, looking for anything, any kind of suspicious activity or anything like that, looking for the car, you know, given out by the police. Yeah, whatever they could find, I guess. Yeah, they were going down a dirt road, dirt path in a pretty heavily wooded area, and they saw a man standing beside a dark car. Right. So he was trying to drag logs across the road. Yeah, block the road. Block the road off behind him. And when they drove by... The man quickly got in, in his car and drove away. Right. Dale, they wrote down the license plate number and reported what they had seen to the police. And investigators later found Opal Buxton's body near where they had seen that black car. Right. Yeah, I saw where they said that they had followed him and he went and pulled into a driveway. But they didn't want to um, confront him at confront all. Confront him, yes. Yeah, yeah. So they went and told the police. And then the police went back. But the guy that was in the house had no idea what they were talking about. So apparently he just pulled in the driveway to get off the trail and then left. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, some of that would be pretty wild to come beat on your door and the guns drawn because you know everybody was on edge. Yep. And everybody around town after Opal's death, uh, they were locking their doors. Nobody was going out. It was a, it was a bad time in Gaffney. Oh, yeah. Man, it was, people were shooting shadows. Yeah, you know, after the first two, is probably pretty bad, and then that little girl got grabbed up. It's, it's bad. Yeah, everybody's watching. <clears throat> watch your kids. No doubt. Take care of your kids. Now, tell they, uh, like I said, they had the license plate number, and they traced it back to a man named Leroy Martin. Lee Roy Martin. Not Leroy, but Lee Roy. Lee Roy. That's two names. Two names. Lee Roy Martin. Right. Now, Dale. So how, many, how long was it before they found Opal? The next day? The next day. Down, okay, when they went and searched yep. where, where the car was, right? Yep. Okay. Now, Leroy Martin was born on April 25th, 1937 in Gaffney, South Carolina. He was a textile mill worker, and he also drove a taxi cab part-time. <laughs> That's scary, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but he, he was the owner of this black car and it turned out to be a 1957 chevy yeah sweet ride no it's a very very sweet ride but dale you know on the surface of everything leroy martin he seemed to be an unlikely suspect you know he just he just didn't fit look like the type that would you know murder be a killer <laughs> at all murder rape and cigarette burn young children yeah well, you know, he always said that he was uh, two different people. Even he told his mama that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I guess this is way before people even had any idea about split personalities or anything like that. So they yeah. they just thought that's why he basically he just said, well, I'm psycho, you know. Now, a lot of Leroy Martin's acquaintances were really, you know, they were stunned by this. Even one woman told a reporter, you know, she worked with Martin and considered him a nice man. And during this strangler scare, He'd even asked, she'd even asked him to walk her to her car because she got right, off work. Get you right home. Yeah, in wow. case it was a killer nearby, nearby or something. Right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, he, you know, I'd heard that he was, you know, active in his church, deacon, different things. I wouldn't doubt it. So, you know, he was, he had definitely had two different lives. On February the 29th of 1968, and this was just shortly after Roy Lee Martin was arrested. We're going back to Roger Deadman, who was in prison for the murder of his wife, Lucille. He was released from prison and returned home to his toddler son. Now, get this, Dale. <laughs> Deadman's in-laws, right? they actually petitioned to keep him in prison, even though he was innocent. Because they wanted to keep his kid. They, wanted, they had custody of his... Of Junior. Yeah, the little boy. He was like he was like two or three years old at the time. Yeah, I think what was it when he when they first arrested him? He's like, "Well, you just keep the baby till I get home." Yeah, and so they're like, "Oh hell, as long as he's locked up, he's ours." Yeah, good God. So they petitioned to keep their son-in-law in prison, in prison even, even though, though he done nothing. Yeah, so they could keep the kid. God Almighty! Yeah, yeah. that make an interesting Thanksgiving. Wasn't it? That's pretty shitty right there. Now <laughs> I'm telling you. Yeah, but uh, he was exonerated. 
and uh, he was released. Well, he should have been. Should have been. They railroaded him the whole thing. I mean, yeah, it was ridiculous. But um, he was in prison, and you know he was going to be exonerated. But they still had to have a trial to just to close things out with him. To get it off the dock. Yeah, get it off the dock. And he had to <laughs> he had to come up with a thousand dollars just to be able to have the trial to get bail. Yeah, to get bail. Or stay in jail another three months or, and, or something weird like that. Yeah. and it makes no sense. You, and, know, I, you know he didn't do it. The other guy already said it. Uh, he's already he, told you everything the woman had and everything. Confessed to confessed it. Confessed to it. Told you where she was, how she was laying, had her eyes open, laying downhill, the whole works, every, all the details he uh-huh. gave. And you still, can I say digging this guy around? He was. <laughs> he's still digging this guy around. I mean, this man working on a chain gang. Yeah. And I mean, he's not. Innocent. He's not letting lock. No, he's not locked up in club fed or whatever. You know, he's <laughs> busting rocks. God Almighty! <laughs> but uh, Deadman did get out of prison, and he served ten months. That's a long time. For, yeah, for not doing nothing. For nothing. And then basically, you get out, you broke. You don't have nowhere to live. You don't have no house. You don't have no nothing. Your wife's dead. And you know people are looking at you. Yeah. You know people are talking about you. And plus, uh, those four kids. I mean, their mom was dead, the three girls, and yeah. then Junior. And I guess they all live with uh, the in-laws, I guess. I guess. So it, it, was, it was tough for Roger. Yeah, it was I, bad. I can't even imagine what that man went through. I guess luckily that uh, Leroy wanted to help him out. Mm-hmm. Or he just felt... I don't know. I don't think Leroy wanted to help him out. I think he was just... Well, that might have pissed been. because he was in prison for something that he done. Maybe one of Leroy's. You know, there's like two or three of them, I think. Yeah. <laughs> or what, consider him, you know, because he'd say he could see him outside of his body watching his other. One of his alter egos. Alter egos doing the killing while he stood up on the hill and watched, you know. Yeah. All that stuff. But, yeah, I, I, I'm definitely on board with the, he's getting credit for one of my kills. Mm-hmm. I don't, you know. Yeah. It's it's pretty crazy, and uh, Leroy's pretty damn sick, you know. Because yeah. even after um, they found Opal, not long after that, you know, Tina her family had a a family visitation. Yeah, where they you know like a basically a funeral in the house. Yeah, like they used to, you know, did have a, they had the parlor in the house. Yeah, and they'd have the body there, you know. And, and people would come by the house and pay respects or whatever. And guess who showed up? Leroy Martin. Yeah. He comes up, hangs out beside his, I guess it was a casket or whatever they done, done with at that point. But anyway, he walked up beside the girl's mom and looking at her. And, and Leroy said, she sure is a pretty girl. I don't see how anybody could done this to her. Oh, man. And their mom offered him a cup of tea and he hung around for a couple hours. Mm-hmm. God Almighty! Yeah, hung around, hung around the house. That's that's sick. It is, man. Yeah, it's. I don't know. I just don't see how people can do shit like mm-hmm. that. Now, Dale, on February the seventeenth, Leroy Martin was charged with four murders, and like we said, on February the twenty eighth, just you know, eleven days later, Roger Deadman was finally released from prison after after serving ten months for murder he didn't commit. And all the three trials he went through, Leroy Leroy Martin waived his right to a jury. Right. And they said that uh, he gave him, uh, he got three, four life sentences, right? Yeah, he did. Yeah. And there was some, some kind of weird stuff. Well, the first uh, the first two, when he, they got charged with the first two, who was they did them separate. The first one he had a thing, but he pled guilty. Mm-hmm. And uh, when the jurors came back out, they said that uh, the head foreman had said that they had, wanted to show mercy and not give him the death penalty but the rest of the jurors said we didn't say that so something fishy was going yeah, on was there. something fishy going on there yeah so that's why he didn't get death penalty because the the juror the the foreman had said that they they wanted to give a mercy ruling or whatever and then the other two he just went ahead and took them so they gave him four yep. life sentences yep and then that's why in prison when he was walking around, because he still, he, it wasn't without the possibility of parole, so technically he could have gotten out sometime. He could have, yeah. Yeah, and said that uh, he used to, and when he went into prison, they didn't really know what was going to happen to him, so the first year or so, he pretty much stayed by himself. Yeah. Because they didn't know what they had, you know, because it's pretty damn, I would say, <laughs> a big-time serial killer in Gaffney in 67 was probably 
pretty terrifying yeah so they didn't really know what they had you know in, in there so and then once they learned that he's kind of kept quiet by himself they let him out in general pop into third year yeah but uh he was working as a, a janitor in the cell block but uh from what i heard is that he would he would say that well you know the king it won't keep me in ever i'll get out here one day and when i do i'll be raping when i get out he'll rape the day he gets out that's what yeah that's and, what he was saying he was bragging on that bragging on that, that since he didn't get the, the no possibility for parole, he was expecting he was going to get out. Yeah. But that didn't work out too good. No, it didn't, it didn't work out at all for him, Dale, because <laughs> on May the 31st of 1972, you know, he was incarcerated at Central Correctional Institute in Columbia, South Carolina. And Leroy Martin was stabbed to death by a fellow inmate named Kenneth Marshall Rumsey. Yep. They stabbed him in the back when he fell, and he just stabbed him up. Several, several, several more times in the front. And there's also a, a theory or a conspiracy or something about, you know, maybe it was a hired hit. Yeah, from the outside. But this dude was in there for life anyway, so he didn't really care. It didn't matter to him. <laughs> Can't give me no more. Mm-mm. So he knew he wasn't getting out. Now, Rumsey, that killed Leroy Martin, he later committed suicide right. in prison. That was on uh, April 11, 1977. Said he went for his regular psych interview, and then he went back to his to a cell, and they later found him hanging, used his pair of pants to, to hang himself. The pair of pants he was, he was wearing. Yeah, there's a, lots of weird stuff that happened around this thing, man. It's like yeah. uh, cursed, haunted stuff. I don't know, whatever. But there's a lot of people who were involved um, died, mm-hmm. or stuff happened. Really, it was weird. Like uh, one of the agents that was uh, heavily involved in the investigation, C.L. McKellen, he died in a fishing boat accident. Yeah. And then... Uh, the car, the, the yeah. 57 Chevy deal. Yeah. The, it was sold at auction for 150 bucks. 150 bucks. Now, when Leroy was driving, it was pretty rough shape. Yeah, it was probably ragged out, but still 150 bucks. I still, yeah, it's still a deal. For a 57 Chevy. But um, it was bought. First guy bought it. He just bought it. And then uh, he kept having people come knocking on his door, wanting to go ride in the murder car. Yeah. Especially women. They wanted to ride in Leroy's murder car. Mm-hmm. And he said that, uh, so he would take them out, and they would go to the dump sites. And he'd go out. And, and uh, park. And shut off the engine and park. And he said it got to where the girls, whoever was in the back seat, would just start freaking out, like trying to get out of the car. They wanted, and uh, it was told that uh, they were hearing screams and hitting and beating coming from the trunk. Yeah. And then other times they would hear, you know, the noises coming from the sites themselves. And eventually he just kind of got freaked out about it. And, you know, he's like, well, let's stay. This car is cursed. I'm going to get rid of it. And so then he sold it to the guy who fixed it up. He never drove it. He just fixed it up to it was like a show car. I think his last name was Bachelor. I think that's, that's what, the first dude. Yeah. The yeah. Ba- okay. Yeah. And I don't know the fellow's name who bought it after him, but he fixed it up like a show car. Yeah. And, but he never drove it until one day. And then the first day he drove it, something happened and it shot off the road, veered off and crashed and killed him, totaled the car. Yeah. So first time he was driving. First it. time he ever drove it, yeah. So there's a lot of there's a lot of hauntings to this down around Gaffney. You know, they can go to the bridges or that bridge where uh, the Paris girl was dumped and they can hear screams at night. We should go down there. We need to go. We'll go in the daytime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Dale, that is the story of Leroy Martin, the Gaffney Strangler. Yeah, that's a pretty, pretty damn good story. I hope we didn't butcher it too bad. Yeah. Yeah, Dale, just one more thing about uh, Leroy Martin. Uh, his M.O., it was reported that he targeted women and young girls walking alone by secluded roads and then forcing them into his car like he did his last victim, Opal. Right. And... Well, I guess he's probably a big old trunk in that 57 Chevrolet. Oh, yeah. You, yeah. Can, you can put some bodies in there. Mm. Yep. And But in Annie Deadman's case, he offered her to enter his cab, you know, enter his car, and after she'd had an altercation with her husband. And then he would rape her and strangle her. And Yeah. Yeah. And in Nancy Reinhardt's case, he engaged, they reported he engaged in necrophilia with her remains. Right. Because he would go back to the site. Yeah, it was unreported. I mean, not unreported, but unconfirmed. But they said that he did actually, because she was out there, you know, what I said, eight eight to ten days before they found yeah. her, that he repeatedly, he admitted he repeatedly went back to the dump site. Now, I don't know what he did. But I wouldn't put it past him. Yep. He was a sick dude, man. 
he had according to him he had a multiple personality right. it was two people so and that's the same one he went to her house for her wake right yeah <laughs> God so that was probably um one last time yep mm. sick bastard man very much so all right like i said that is the story of leroy martin the gaffney strangler the gaffney strangler yep all right dale we're gonna get out of here all right brother we want everyone to be safe be careful and always be aware of your surroundings because the next episode could be about you this is the The crack Crack house Chronicles. chronicles